I would like to talk about the solution to the issue that is deteriorating the unity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I talk about the antagonism between the pro and anti or non-Trinitarian groups in the series called The Common Ground here on YouTube. I do believe that this controversy is truly an issue for our church, but I do not think that the solution solemnly rests upon the doctrine. This controversy, just like every other, is not about the theological issue per se, rather is the character issue of the believer dealing with one another. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing the doctrinal importance, but when the character issues are solved, then the environment for the constructive dialogue will be formed, and that has a real potential to solve theological issues. So I want to share with you a very interesting example that demonstrates this fact. So here is the story. On Facebook, there are many pro-Trinitarian and anti or non-Trinitarian groups, but there are two very active ones. One is called the Heavenly Trio Truth, which is a Trinitarian, and another one is called the Heavenly Trio Revealed, which is mostly non-Trinitarian. I am part of both, and I'm not really active member of any of them. But I observe that both of these groups suffer from the problem of pointing fingers to another. And this is a problem that fuels the antagonism. The Heavenly Trio Truth group is not really a Trinitarian group as much as it is anti-anti-Trinitarian. And most of the posts about the they they post about inconsistencies of non-Trinitarians. And the most prominent effort to this was is the effort of Brother Chris Chung. On the other hand, the Heavenly Trio Revealed group is not much better. There are a lot of discussion of what others believe, and people act as if they could bring as much as inconsistencies of the other groups that that group eventually wins. I want to ask you, do you know what God thinks about this? I want to share my opinion here, and I would like to demonstrate one example of dealing with this issue. And I found that I mean, it's a partial answer to God's opinion about this in Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 17. These six things does the Lord hate. Yeah, seven are an abomination unto him. The one is the proud look. Second, lying tongue and, and hands that shed innocent blood is the third. The fourth, the heart that devise wicked imaginations. And then fifth, Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Sixth one is a false witness that speaks lies. And then the seventh, the abomination in, he that showeth discord among brethren. My problem with the behavior exercised by these two groups is that I cannot know what the other person actually believes. And because I cannot know this, I run into temptation of misrepresenting my brethren. So, this always will result with the false witness. We read in Proverbs that God hates the lying tongue. And because of my ignorance, I do not want to be the reasons for discord among brethren. This is abomination to the Lord. God has not called me to be a judge of someone's belief. But rather he called me to be his witness and give reasons for the hope that is within me. So the approach to the same message is very different. So instead of pointing fingers to what others believe, God calls me to be open about my own personal beliefs. And because of the antagonism between these two groups, people conceal what they personally believe and they deal with what other people believe because that's much simpler. But here is the promise that God has given to those who are willing to put their finger down. And we read this in chapter 58 of Isaiah, dealing with the true fast. So in verse 9, it says, Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, which is the sin. And then it says, The putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfies the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as of the noonday. 
The verse 10, as it speaks of a physical need, so does it speaks of a spiritual need. So how can I draw out my own soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul? I have to share the reasons for the hope that is within me. God calls me to be his witness and not of his judge. So we should put down our judgmental fingers of what others believe and we should speak what God has taught us. So instead of this person says this and that, we should say the Lord says this and that. Therefore, I believe it. And the truth of the matter is that we all can be wrong and mistaken. So when you start to speak of your own beliefs, especially publicly, you're making yourself vulnerable. And that's good. Public scrutiny is a positive thing. And if you care more about the truth rather than always being right, then you will not have a problem of being God's witness. Now, this controversy of what other beliefs recently have been fueled by Brother Chris Chung. So allow me to put aside antagonism that Chris Chung is causing for a moment and show you how constructive it is when you allow yourself to be open about your own beliefs. I want to share with you a conversation I had with brother Chris Chung when the antagonism is removed from the equation. Chris, he was asking me questions and I was giving him reasons for the hope that is within me. And you will be surprised how brother Chris was constructive. I hope that this conversation would open eyes to many, especially about the truth and the presence and personality of God, because this is my main objective here. I also believe that this can help Chris as well. So this conversation was from November 19, 2021. I think this is also important to have in mind. It was arranged by Brother Timothy. It was the group that all three of us were there, where Chris have asked me a question. He says, hi, brother. So on page 46, it's page 46 on uh, Forgotten Pillar book. It says, It is fair to point out that the Trinity was not part of the Seventh-day Adventist faith in her time and came into our ranks, ranks later. That statement is hard to understand. Can you explain more? And he added, here is a doctrinal statement from 1913, and this is by uh, Wilcox from uh, 1913 in Review and Herald where it says that Adventists believe in divine trinity. Now, this statement that I said, it was derived clearly from the fundamental principles. And the fundamental principles, that was the official statement of Seventh-day Adventist faith. The more precisely, the declaration of the fundamental principles was the declaration of the Seventh-day Adventist faith, and it was official document what Seventh-day Adventists have believed. So... It was reprinting from um, 8072 all the way to 1914, 1915, Sister White died. Um, they had it in pamphlets, they reprinted it in years, yearbooks, and everybody knew that this is what Adventists believe, and, and so on. But now, our comment is that Wilcox's statement does not rule out the fundamental principles, I will not go so deep into that. I will just, if you want to, you can pause video and see if, you, if you're willing to, to read. Okay. Mm. So he doesn't understand the statement that at that time, in 1903, they, the Trinity was not part of Seventh-day Adventist faith, officially. And I, and I say again, okay, it's simple. The Seventh-day Adventist faith in 1903 were represented by the fundamental principles. The Trinity was not part of the fundamental principles. And he says, what Trinity are you referring to? So here are the fundamental principles. Here's the first point dealing with who is one God. As we can read, it says here, as elsewhere stated, Seventh-day Adventists have no creed but the Bible, that they hold certain well-defined points of faith, which they feel prepared to give reasons to every man that asks them. The following propositions may be taken as a summary of the principal features of their religious faith, upon which there is, so far as we know, the entire unanimity of the body they believe. And then there are 28 points. 
So the first point is that there is one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, infinite wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable, ever, ever present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. The second point is that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Eternal Father, the one by whom he created all things. He refers to one God, the creator, by whom, uh, by, you know, Christ, by Christ, this creator created all things. So one God here is referring to the Father. So if we talk about the Trinity, I don't know which Trinity he sees here. It's the Seventh-day Adventist faith had not had Trinity doctrine in 1903. Not as the official statements, not as the fundamental principles. But he asked, what Trinity are you referring to? And then I said, okay, the one that Sister White refuted. It's interesting to see that Sister White was refuting the Trinity doctrine by uplifting the fundamental principles. We're going to see data later. But he asked which one of that, and it says one God made of three co-equal persons. And he asked, how did you come to that conclusions? Please share evidence. And I said, well, you can read it in my book, number one, because the, the idea is contrary to the personality of God. And personality of God is the doctrine that is very well encapsulated, let's say. So it's not something unknown or something like that, because Sister White have had a vision on it. In this vision, it's called Vision on Personality of God. She says, I've often seen lovely Jesus that he is a person. I ask if his father was a person and had a form like himself. And Jesus answered, I am the express image of my father's person. So what the whole thing about is, just if you're first time seeing this, what the personality of God means in historical sense. Personality of God deals with the question that father is a person because he has a form. More precisely, it deals that, you know, he has a physical form. And if you look into fundamental principles... Uh, it says, one God, a personal spiritual being. This being includes having a form, a physical form. And as such, you know, he's, ev he's not everywhere present because in, in his form, in his body, he's in this holy temple, in the most holy place currently, if after passing of time in AD 44. And, but his omnipresence is through his representative, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is truly the Spirit. And there is a difference between truly the spirit and spiritual being. So their whole topic about that is compound in the doctrine on the presence and personality of God. And that topic was the thing that Kellogg rejected. He made some, um, how to say, he, 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 he was departing from that particular doctrine. So we go on with Chris Chung, and it's interesting conversation because it's very productive. There is there are no antagonism between us. We're just going and sharing what we know and what we believe. I mean, I am the one who share what I believe, but he is not constraining himself of of knowing what he believes as well. So. If you drop off one God, not to go in his question, what what God means. When you say one God, what do you mean? He says one God in John 17, 21, 22. One God in like, it's not speaking of one God in John 17, 21. He speaks of a unity that God is in the Christ, Christ in the Father. And we are united in Christ, you know, with this is not about one God. It's about unity, unity in spirit. But one God, Bible speaks of the Father, just as the fundamental principles are pointing out in a very simple way. But I'm not going with him into this direction, so I said, you can drop it off. Doesn't matter, the argument on the personality of God is much stronger. And that argument is that God, one God, is one personal spiritual being, one being. And he's not ever present by himself because he has a physical body, but he's ever present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. So I said the whole thing boils down to the point that the Father is ever present by his representative, Holy Spirit, because... That is of the, the teaching of the personality of God. And now Chris, being surprised, I mean, I wrote the book entirely. This is the entire topic of the book. 
He's, he wants to check, sure, if, if this is what I believe. He says, yes, this is what I believe. And he says, okay, so do I. So he believes, you know, that Father is not ever a present by himself, but by his representative, the Holy Spirit. And he believes that, you know, Father has a physical form. And then I said, okay, great, that even if you adhere to the name Trinity, I do, mind, do not mind, because the whole naming thing I find irrelevant if you believe in the personality of God. People are extremely defensive if you say, hey, this is not Trinitarian or something like that. And, well, let's keep on reading, because he says, okay, most Trinitarians I know would agree with you as well. But as I said, sadly, there are some Trinitarians which would agree with Dr. Kellogg's sentiments on the personality of God. But I'm aware that some most of Trinitarians, I, I believe in that most of the Trini, Trinitarians that, you know, Chris knows that they, they would agree with the statement that the Father is not ever present by himself, but by his representative, the Holy Spirit. I know this is not reflected in our official statement of belief. Nowhere. It's far from that. Um, one God is omnipresent by himself. This is, if you look into, into our statement. But doesn't mean if, you know, if somebody is Trinitarian, that he ad admits to everything what is written in the official beliefs. Anyways, um, and I said, yes, I'm aware of that, that the fact that there are Trinitarians who believe this, but I always ask everybody to help me out, harmonize the Trinitarian idea of three co-equal persons with the truth and the presence and personality of God. And now he, he's wondering, like, what do you mean by co-equal? And this is our conversation that goes in. He's not familiar that this exists within our teaching. So I'll skip that. Um, what do you mean co-equal? But eventually in our discussion, he comes to understanding what co-equal means. So let me, let me read something for you. I will actually go back. He came to, yeah, I'm going to read this. So he came back to me a few, late, a few days later and says, what are your thoughts on Kellogg's position as quoted by Daniels? And Daniels is writing to William White about Kellogg's attention to revise the book Living Temple. He says, I, he told me, Kellogg told to Daniels, that he now believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And Kellogg's view was that it was God the Holy Ghost, and not God the Father that filled all space and every living thing. And he asked that because it seems like you would be in agreement with this particular position, Kellogg's position, uh, above just asking for clarity, because you stated the whole thing boils down to the point that the Father is ever represented by his representative, the Holy Spirit, and that if one believes this, then, he quotes again, that's great, then I'd, even if you adhere to the name Trinity, I do not mind, because the whole naming thing of finding relevant if you believe in the personality of God. So he asked us like, hey, seemingly this means that you are agreeing with Dr. Kellogg. But it's far from that because, yeah, it sounds like as you would find us agreeing on based on the words, if, if I say, hey, I don't care for the word Trinity itself. But what Kellogg is doing a problem, he he missed the substance. This is the truth and teaching us on the presence and personality of God. And then I go a little bit details in that. I'm going to read it because I would like to show you that Chris Chung's agrees with the first point of the fundamental principles. That's the whole point. He says Kellogg is trying to fix his book and trying to convince Daniels that his Trinitarian position would solve the issue. I'll give you some data and then I will give you my conclusions if you and you can check it yourself. And he agreed on that. I'm just wondering... What's your thoughts on the position here? So, in the living temple, Kellogg said, Says one, God may be present by his spirit or by his power, but certainly God himself cannot be present everywhere at once. And this is what I believe. This is what, you know, fundamental principles are pointing out and pioneers what are pointing out. Ellen White is pointing out to that as well. But here he's objecting to this idea in living temple. And he says, we answer to object to that. How can power be separate from the source of power where God's spirit is at work, where God's power is manifested, God himself is actual and truly present? So this is from Living Temple, page 28. 
When he says, says one is referring to Adventist pioneers and the fundamental principles we have seen for the fundamental principles. And now I says, what is the bottom ground soling evaluation of Dr. Kellogg's book? And I said this. This is a quote from Ellen White. It's the chapter 10 of Special Testimonies uh, called The Foundation of Our Faith, where she talks about foundation of our faith to be the fundamental principles that we have just read. I mean, this is declaration of these fundamental principles, to be more precise. So she says, I've been instructed by the heavenly messenger. So that's not a, her own opinion, but this is what the heaven has to say about the living temple. That's what matters, actually. It says that some of the reasoning in the book Living Temple is unsound. And this reasoning, the effect would, effect would be, that would lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth. It introduces that which is not by speculation in regard to the personality of God and the way he presents it. So very specifically says which reasoning it is. It is reasoning regarding the presence and personality of God. And those people who are subjected to fall off um, are those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation of present truth. The foundation principles of present truth were the fundamental principles. This is right in the context because she writes there that the fundamental principles were the foundation of our faith. And Chris Chunks agrees with this. So I said this is extremely important. And I again said this, these are the fundamental principles. You know, the official statement of Seventh-day Adventist faith. Uh, precise point regarding personality of God and where his presence is. The first point of fundamental principles. The point which deals with the personality of God and where his presence is. I quote the first point of the fundamental principles. You know, there is one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on. Unchangeable, ever present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. Chris Chung says, Amen. This is very strange. I mean, this is very, very, very strange and rare to see a Trinitarian that would agree with the first point of the fundamental principles. I must say. No, I said, once you get into the doctrine of the presence and personality of God, you would see that our pioneer says, it is not God in one place more than the other. So, God possesses a physical body. And I'm just explaining what this means. He cannot be everywhere present by himself, but by his representative, the Holy Spirit. He's a personal, spiritual being. Kellogg disagreed with this. Why? Because he rejected the idea that God has a physical body, meaning that Father was has, having a physical body. And now, back to his question, you know, he told me that he believes and so what he believes. Basically, what happened, happened is that he's doing, he's swapping the Father with the Holy Spirit, thinking that this issue, this would solve the issue. In Trinitarian view of three co-equal persons, equal in personality, this is possible. But in the fundamental principles... In the doctrine of the presence and personality of God, this is not possible. Not even, and and even though his statement that God is ever present by his Holy Spirit is true, his sentiments have changed regarding, have not changed regarding the personality of God, which was the real issue. But I say there is more evidence that Kellogg's view on the on the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal personality. There are more, which is typical Trinitarian sentiment. Kellogg received rebuke for such sentiment. I said, I'm glad to see this, and he just amen the first point of fundamental principles. So, where Chris Chung have connected some dots, maybe it was not very clear from the beginning what I'm talking about. But he says, okay, so I understand correctly, if I understand correctly, you reject the idea that Holy Spirit has a body and flesh. That's correct. This is Luke 24, 39, Jesus says, um, behold me, behold my hands and my feet, for it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. There was Jesus standing in the spiritual body because it was after the resurrection. First Corinthians 15 says, there is a, we sow in a natural body and we were raised in the spiritual body. There is natural body and there is a spiritual body. Spiritual body is the body of the angels, because Jesus says that in the resurrection we're going to be as angels. So, spiritual body and spiritual being is not the same thing as being the literal spirit. 
and he compares himself in his spiritual body with the spirit, like spirit has no flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And Chris Chung understands this and he approves this. So right above from the beginning, it says, I refer to the basic Trinitarian promise, uh, premise that the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit are not a person in the same way, are the persons in the same way, but they are not. And now he just connects the dots. He says, this is how I understand your statement that the Spirit has no flesh, no bones, therefore is everywhere present. You also reject that the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are persons in very same way. He says, you also reject this. This is what you mean when you say co-equal, flesh and bones of all three. And because I approve that I don't believe the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body, he says, okay, great, so do I. I haven't met any Trinitarian to believe that the Holy Spirit has a flesh and bones and confined to the body, have you? So I boil down to his statement that, you know, that it's very rare to see from, from a Trinitarian that doesn't believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal, the persons in the same way, co-equal personalities. So I boil down and I just, you know, affirm this and says, yes, the Father is all the fullness of God had bodily. In Son dwells all the fullness of God had bodily. The first one is the Ellen White, the second is the Bible from Colossians. While the Holy Spirit has no flesh and bones, all three are persons, but not in the same way because aforementioned sentiment. Ellen White's vision on the personality of God supports this. And Chris Chung says, Amen, 100%. It is very, very rarely that Trinitarians do this. Now, he says that he doesn't know any Trinitarian that believes in this, uh, that doesn't believe and doesn't agree with him on that, which is like very, very, I, I, I wish this is true, I truly wish, but you don't get the opportunity that people who do believe this, they express their beliefs in such a way, and mainly because of the antagonism, and that's something that I want to address. So I want to believe Chris Chung that this is the thing that Trinitarians believe, that don't believe in three co-equal persons, although our literature is full of that. But I want to take a benefit of doubt that this is true, because I want to believe that this is true. I would love to see when, when you know, Trinitarians will speak about the truth and the presence and personality of God, which we had had in the beginning. I would love to see the Trinitarians going and defending the first point of the fundamental principles. I would love to see that. I mean, he agrees on that, you know, and he speaks that all the Trinitarians he knows, like, agree on that. And recently he has been, you know, going on crusades in publics and saying how, you know, Trinitarians are all unanimous in their beliefs and anti-Trinitarians are inconsistent. And the funny thing about it is he attacked me publicly about the my statement that there is a difference in understanding of being and person. Namely, the difference is that being always consists of physical form. This is something I derived from Ellen White writings and all the teachings on the presence and personality of God. And also that person, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you that it must have bodily form. Because it, sometimes it can be by, like a character of office or representative in case of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is a person but doesn't have a form. And these are the points that we agree on. So in the very same essence, when we're talking about what do you mean by word person or, or, or by the terms of meaning, we agree on the meaning. But Brother Chris goes around in crusade saying that, you know, our meanings are contradictory. And then I talk with him and, and we discuss things and then I pointing him back and back back to this point that we have been discussing here. Um, at that point is the presence and personality of God, which was the very essence of our of 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 the of the whole controversy. He just goes on, you know, and creating more of more antagonism, which is I don't know, you be the judge. But there is, I believe, much, much bigger issue that is standing here specifically with 
Chris Chung, but not only about him, but also with, I've seen and observed in non-Trinitarian community. And this is lack of understanding what the presence and personality of God doctrine actually teaches. If we would focus on that, I believe there could be a unity and mutual understanding. As with the Trinitarians, who are all united, and according to his words, probably they all believe in the first point of the fundamental principles and, and presence and personality of God, which is not true. And I want to show you data that this is not the truth. So as the time have passed, I have seen a post in the Heavenly Tree of Truth group. This is a Trinitarian group. Chris, what are your thoughts on our Trinitarian brethren, which are openly denying the distinction of the Father and the Son having physical body compared to the Holy Spirit? And I left him a link. And interestingly... <laughs> Before lefting this link, he was commenting on that post, not defending the non-Trinitarian brother who was bringing out the understanding, historical understanding on the presence and personality of God, the one that Sister White has defended and all of these pioneers have held in that beginning. And he's checking it out and so on. So do you see how there, how many of our brethren object to this point just because they defend the Trinity? He doesn't know of these three co-equal. So we are speaking about, you know, the unity of the Trinitarian party, let's say. And it says, Brother Carl Holland pointed out clearly that the Father and the Son have physical bodies and the Holy Spirit does not. Just as you said that all Trinitarians I know believe this to be true. And he's the moderator in this group, by the way. He received a quite backlash. I know as well that I re received backlash for the same from the very same people over there. And more disturbing thing is that the accusatory, twisting, straw man behavior I received in that group, so I decided not to participate in it. It says, could you copy paste a specific comment? As if, like, <laughs> all comments are there. Problematic. And here's one. So here's a Richard Mendoza. He says, get off the physical body stuff. And the physical body that we speak are the part is the very essence of the doctrine of the presence and personality of God. And why is he doing? Because he's being consistently consistent Trinitarian of three co-equal persons. Look at this. The Father doesn't have a physical body, either yet you accept him as a real person. Ellen White says as much a person as God is a person, speaking of Holy Spirit. So, equalizing Father with the Holy Spirit, that's what he does. And that closes the door to a tangible being. Of course, Holy Spirit doesn't have a body theory in order to qualify as a person. Well, that's not actually true what we what we teach. Just simply accept the third person of the Godhead. You see, he doesn't get it. And don't try to explain it. That's the heavenly tree. Another way to say Trinity. One group of three individual persons. What do you mean by term person? This is the whole point. And when we are dealing with the term person regarding to the Father, with the doctrine of the presence and personality of God, the vision that Sister White have on the personality of God, is that the Father... Is Father a person having a form like Jesus does? I'm the express image of my Father's person. So both of them have forms. And, you know, there's way more evidence to support this. I'm just taking the main part. And then he says the Holy Spirit is a part of who God is. He is God himself. Here's, here's, and I says, there are more of them. The root of the backslash lies to the idea that the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit... Our person is the exact same way. I simply call this co-equal personality. My question for you is, do you find any issue with Carl's opinions? Original post. Because the essence in this post is that Father has a physical body, the Son as well, but the Spirit has no flesh and bones, therefore is everywhere present. How come he receives such a backslash if all Trinitarians you know believe in that? So this is telling you that his own perception that they are all in agreement and harmony is false because they are not. Obviously they are not. And now here becomes how he defend this post. So that's the point I want to discuss a little bit. He says, I finished reading some of uh, it was above my level of comprehension. I would need clarification. He says some of it now making a criticism or call Carl's post, which was something he was defending by, by original Adventist beliefs. He says some of it, here's what he says, was narrowly defined. 
And I'm not dogmatic on certain aspect that he was strong on. So Carl is strong on, but because, you know, he, Carl is not strong on and he's not so dogmatic. For example, and now he says it specifically, flesh and bones. I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised. But then again, I've never seen a glorified body to know what it comprises. Some text indicates items above my comprehension that would be speculation. Also, the Father and Son are able to go invisible. The Father is also manifest in form. We're going to address this. And I addressed that back then. And we're going to look at this. And it says, Un Up until this point, I comprehend everything. I agreed with most of it, except personally, I wouldn't be as dogmatic. So here, I'm just giving him what the pioneers have been saying. But I want to give you a little bit of context of what is happening. So because now he's backtracking, because he wants to present like, oh, we are united, we, we, we have the same understanding and etc. I want to show you what do you need to do, what path you need to take. And this is based on data in order to preserve this unity. So there are clearly people who are spiritualists who don't accept that God has a physical body and they don't get rebuked in this group. They, they, they got praises. They got taps on their shoulders like, well done, you're fighting against this heretical anti-Trinitarians and so on. Because the whole point is, you know, to prove the other side wrong and not to look and search for the truth. Now, in order to open up where this path goes, let us go into the living temple itself. The problem is people are looking into Kellogg and they want to show the other side, you know, to attach this Kellogg issue on their side. But nobody is actually talking what the problem with the Kellogg was. Like, okay, can you show me in the living temple what the problem actually was? So we're going to look what his views on the presence and personality of God was. Already we have seen a statement that says, says one, God may be present by his spirit or by his power, but certainly God himself cannot be present everywhere at once, which is reference to the official belief, Seventh Adventist faith, first point of the fundamental principles. He's objecting, saying, how can the power be separated from the source of power where God's spirit is at work, where God's power is manifested, God himself is actually truly present. And now he makes his metaphor over the you know, shoemaker and so on. But because the doctrine on the presence and personality of God are linked together, he immediately, you know, attacks the point on the personality of God. And he says, but says one, this thought destroys the personality of God. So if you remember the point of the heavenly messenger says that, you know, this reasoning, what we are going to read here, are leading astray those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation of of the present truth. And then it says that those reasoning is are not the speculation regarding the personality of God. So those are person and where his presence is and this one. So this is not the speculation. But what does he says? He doesn't deny per se that this is, you know, that this destroys the personality of God. Moreover, he goes and approves the point the father has a physical body and and you know he says that he's in specific place by his body. And he says, an infinite divine person, a personal being is essential religion. The belief in the personal God is the very core of the Christian religion. The conception of God, all energy, the infinite power, all prevailing presence is too vast for human mind to grasp. And he says there must something more tangible. So he uses the word tangible, restricted upon to center the mind and worship and so on. So he says here the fact that, that God is so great, we cannot form a clear mental picture of his physical appearance. Need not lessen our minds the reality of his personality. Did you catch that? So physical appearance, when he talks about personality of God, he talks about the physical appearance. And people want to put this thing off like this is not part of what the personality of God is. No, this is exactly what the part of the personality of God is. He talks about the physical appearance and all this what he speaks of is about the physical appearance of God. 
Neither does this conception disagree with that of the specific expression of God in some particular form or place. And he approves that. Indeed, there are scriptures which present God in his definite and one may say circumstantial form as sitting upon a throne in heaven or dwelling in the temple of Jerusalem. So, first of all, Kellogg is not per se negating this. He acknowledges that. That's the point. But then he makes this extra step that goes into, and we're not going to read everything, that he says, but I would not be so dogmatic about this. The heavenly messenger has said, it would lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth with the fundamental principles. And it says, those reasonings are not per speculation in regard to the presence and personality of God. Here is the conclusion that Kellogg had made. First, he, he makes his point pointing to the Isaiah 40, speaking of the, you know, his physical appearance and so on. So he makes this application literal. But here he makes his point. This is entire conclusion on the personality of God. He says, discussion respecting the form of God are utterly unprofitable and serve only to belittle our conception of him who is above all things and hence not to be compared in form or size or glory in majesty with anything which man has ever seen or which is in his power, in power to conceive. In the presence of questions like these, we have only to acknowledge our foolishness and incapacity and bow our heads with awe and reverence in the presence and personality of intelligent being to the existence of of which all nature bears definite and positive testimony, but which is far beyond our comprehension as are the bounds of the space and time. So I question who would argue against his final conclusion on the personality of God. I rarely find anyone who does, who does this, but this is, according to the heavenly messenger, a deception. And it's a very good one, because he's just not so dogmatic about, you know, some idea that God has a body is not ever present by himself, you know, and so on. He has a physical appearance, a physical bodily form. So he's constrained on a certain place in heaven and not everywhere present. Because ontologically, this is ontology. Ontologically, there is a difference between Holy Spirit and the Father, suddenly. And then there is an equal um, ontological similarity or equivalence with the Father and the Son. This is not Trinitarian stuff. It will never be. And then I say, this is, this is what I say to people who do accept the presence and personality of God. I fail to harmonize this with the, with, with the Trini basic Trinitarian premises. And what I ask is like, okay, if you're Trinitarian, you must have then better understanding, so please help me out. But this is what never happens. It happens that people who agree on the presence and personality of God initially start to degrade, you know, and going into... The you know, prospects of Dr. Kellogg. And they think they're perfectly fine, you know, they don't see the differences. So, this is a huge deception with Dr. Kellogg. And I want to show you a few more quot quotations from Ellen White, just to make sure that, I will use this word, just to be a little bit more dogmatic about this doctrine that we have had in the beginning. So he, here is a letter from Ellen White to Dr. Kellogg. She says, We believe in 1903 the same truths we believed when we established the sanatorium and the college in Battle Creek. We know, and listen to this, that we have no ifs or ends about this matter. So why is there no ifs or ends about this matter? Why are they being so dogmatic? Because they had a definite, clear understanding what the God has revealed regarding his personality. And she says that directly to him. She says, The sanctuary question is a clear and definite doctrine as we have held as a people. You are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as people. So if you cannot see, there is a definite doctrine. And is a, you need to be definitely clear on the personality of God. And... I know it feels very enticing to say, hey, I'm not so dogmatic, I'm not so narrow-minded, and so on. But open up, just go on, open up your views, and you're getting into opening up the views as Dr. Kellogg had. And what happened? We have stepped off from the foundation of the fundamental principles. 
So people might feel like confused in regards to like, okay, what is the true solution to this? Like how I know that I'm not narrow-minded or I'm open-minded and so on. Sister White has given us solution and I want you to read this for you. This is what she advi advises us what to do in regard to this particular problem. I have had presentation regarding the deception that Satan is bringing in at this time. This is today. I have been instructed that we should make prominent the testimony of some of the old workers who are now dead. Let them continue to speak through their articles as found in the early numbers of our papers. These articles should be now printed that there may be a living voice of the Lord witness. The history of early experiences in the message will be a power to withstand the mastery ingenuity of Satan's deceptions. This instruction has been repeated recently. I must present before the people the testament of the Bible truth and repeat the decided messages given years ago. This is in 1905. Can you see this? So she's not talking about contemporary of Kellogg's people, like Kellogg's generation. She's speaking about all prominent workers who have gone through the great disappointment experience. And these workers she calls to be pioneers. Chris Chung has all of his, he's not the only person, who has all these ideas that, you know, Kellogg's contemporaries are the pioneers. But, you know, I have had presentation regarding the deception that Satan is bringing at this time, and she's writing at 1905. So just think about it, what you take as a relevant information to base, what, what you based your understanding of. So let's read a couple more quotations from the same. When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, and it's very clear what this was, let the aged men who were pioneers in our, in our work speak plainly and let those who are dead speak also by reprinting the articles in our periodicals. So how can we know exactly what is this definite understanding on the presence and personality of God? Sister White says, hey, look at these pioneers and look at their reprinting. In The Forgotten Pillar, every next chapter goes with the pioneer writings about the personality of God. And there everything is explained. And they're not using some crazy understanding. They just take the Bible and explain everything through the Bible. One particularly, I want to read to you as the, this was the response of mine to Brother Chunk when he was saying, well, I don't know if, how did he say it? He says, also the Father and Son are able to go invisible. The Spirit is able to be menaced and informed. So he is not quite sure what all this thing is about. So I pointed him out to the article written by James White and Uriah Smith. And I want to read this article for you here. So, angels are real beings, it says. They are described in the Bible as possessing face, feet, wings, etc. Ezekiel saw of the cherubim, the whole body, and their backs and their hands and their wings, etc. Angels appear unto Abraham. They talked and ate with him. They went out to Sodom and communed with Lot, who entering into the house baked unleavened bread for them that they did eat. These persons would call angels. David speaks of the manna as the corn of heaven and angels' food. The case of Balaam is an interesting incident. This is very, very important and interesting incident. Here it is. The angel appeared to Balaam with a sword drawn in hand. The question is sometimes asked, how angels can be material beings since we cannot see them? This case illustrates it. The record says, The Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel. The angel did not create a body for the occasion. He was just as he was before Balaam saw him. But the change took place in Balaam. His eyes were opened. So the change is not in the, in the nature of, of, of the angel cells, but the change happened in the eyes of Balaam. It was the same with the servant of Elijah when he and his master were brought into straight place, surrounded by the army of King Syria. Elijah prayed that the eyes of the servants might be opened, and he immediately saw that the mount of full of horses and chariots around Elijah. 
And that says this further may be illustrated in referring to things which we know are material yet which we cannot see and so on. The further objection to the materiality of angels are that they're called spirits. So again, but this is no objection to their being literal beings. Do you, do you see what the term being means? It means to have a body. They are simply spiritual beings organized differently from the earthly bodies which possess. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15.44, read carefully. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. The natural body we now have, the spiritual body we shall have in the resurrection. It is raised in a spiritual body, verse 44. But when we are, but then we are equals unto angels in resurrection, just as Jesus says in Luke 20, 36. Then we have body like unto Christ, most glorious body, which he had in resurrection. Philippians 3, 4, and Christ is no less a spirit than the angels. We read that God is a spirit that is simply a spiritual being. And there are more and more quotations and answers of the, the pioneers that go over the scripture references that explains this heavenly realities and what is going on. So the term material is a term thrown around by pioneers quite often. This term is designated to make a marked contrast to the term spiritual. You can read this in Articles of Personality of God from our pioneers. And if you read my book, you would see how Sister White embraces those sentiments of our pioneers. So thank you for the resources. Do you have Spirit of Prophecy? And he says, I don't see the pioneers as infallible sources of truth, although I think the statements made sense, which is good that he thinks that it made sense. But the pioneers we are talking about are those who have passed through the great disappointment. The pioneers who Sister White called pioneers, not the generation of Ellen White that Chris Chung calls pioneers, are based upon them, he goes and, they, and, and sets his all belief that being doesn't necessarily mean the physical form, but it always means the same thing as a person. There is no semantics. I mean, go. I, I, don't, I don't mind if you define th things differently, but the point of him just to pursue this idea that being and, and person, the words are one and the same, is just to show to the world how Trinitarians are united and non-Trinitarians, or so those who don't believe in the Trinity, are not united. So he takes syntactics rather than semantics. And we have had this discussion recently on Facebook, which I would like to show you, that has actually, you know, encouraged me to do this video, basically. But I want to give a benefit of doubt to Brother Chris, because in recent art discussion, maybe he's completely ignorant of what the true understanding is of the presence and personality of God. And this is what I see through his answers and the ignorance that he displays through the answer. So let me give you the proof of that. So he says that Terry and I believe that there are three persons here are three beings. Bodily form does not determine whether a person is a person. Personality determines whether a person is person. So this is wrong. I mean, to, finally to say he's being dogmatic here in this sentence, because, you know, you have this vision of Ellen White, that she says, well, I often see lovely Jesus, that he's a person, ask if his father was a person, had a form like himself, said Jesus, I'm the express image of my father's person. So, just with reasoning on that, would you take this quote and ask, what is the distinct characteristic of marks of personality? That the answer is form, the external appearance, bodily form or appearance. True or false? And he says false. Obviously, he doesn't see that this is the doctrine on, on vision, on the doctrine of the personality of God. Because he says false, first of all, Paragus you cited does not mention the word personality. And then you also said here, demons in spirit form are capable of dwelling inside of the human body. When they exited the body of the demoniac and entered into the swine, you didn't see physical being crawling out and lying, flying into the swine. Nevertheless, they were still persons with unique personalities of their own. And here is how one ought to put it. And this is, you know, some non-Adventist non author. But he has the point of saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't have a feet and eyes and so on. 
but it calls him a being, which is, in my opinion, not correct. But you remember what I wrote him to, to personal chat. So the same thing I wrote him in this chat as well. And this is how, how our conversation had gone. And some brothers were asking, okay, can you tell us what you actually believe? And in his opinion, saying what he actually believes, he says the following. He says, some non-Trinitarian seems to think that the person must have a bodily form in order to be a person. So it's not true that he must have. Uh, not in order to be a person, but I say, but I mean in, in to be a being. However, these are the characteristics of corporality and not personality, and he dismisses the personality altogether. All will agree that angels are persons, and when in spirit form with evils are able to inherit the bodies of human. No, that is the following passage. When the demons left the man's body, you didn't see a bunch of angels climbing out of his offices and flying into the swine, rather they exited in, in entered into invisibility. Obviously, the reasons why nobody saw demons flying out from demoniacs to the swines are because, you know, all of people do not see. Like, regular, we don't see angels. But just because we don't see them doesn't mean they are not materials. It's just that God has not shown, give us this ability to see the angels around us. Anyways, these arguments which our pioneers have been adopting and which have been constituting the faith of Seventh-day Adventist uh, truth and the foundation are, do, do not have any value to Brother Chris. And even if you repeatedly show him, he will not accept this, obviously. So I would encourage every everyone, even Chris Chunk, I believe he's very, very near to the truth because he says things that are not in accordance with Trinitarian standard belief. And he does have some understanding of the truth. I would encourage him you know, take the Forgotten Pillar book, because I know no other book to recommend, that is dealing with this historical understanding what we as a Seventh day Adventist had believed in the regard of the presence and personality of God. That we understand what, what have been the issue that Kellogg had departed. And if we could focus on the truth rather than error, we will come to the truth. And I really mean this. If you believe in the Trinity, but you agree on the presence of personality of God, please help me out, as well as many others. If you can harmonize it, I would like to know. That's what I need. So this is the, the vulnerable part of, of the entire video. Because instead of attacking me like Chris Chung is doing, he's not doing me a favor or Christian duty that we should do to one another. It's like, if he has more knowledge, understanding of the presence and personality of God, he should not be his actions like, hey, I don't want to discuss with you, or ignoring the evidences, etc. But rather, he should be of a teachable spirit and show, hey, the Bible teaches this, this, and that. Let's get definite and clear on the presence and personality of God. So this is my constructive suggestion I want to give to Seventh-day Adventist community. But if they choose to go with antagonism and all this proving on inconsistency among each other, then I don't want to be part of it. That, that's all that I want to say. Um, good luck. I, I will be here and I will talk about the truth that we have had in the beginning and something that is very, very clear from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I wish you a lot of God's blessing in the studies. If you have heard something new or something that you think, okay, there is some substance I want to learn, feel free to download the Forgotten Pillar book in the link in the description. May God bless you.